Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. In another follow-up to the first year of the crossover, we're going back to Devil's Due Publishing, their continuity which entwined the formation of real American heroes with the arrival of alien robots in disguise. First, it was subjugation by Cobra, the enemy. Then it was traveling through Earth's time to prevent disaster. Now a new threat emerges as we begin taking issue with G.I. Joe vs. Transformers 3, The Art of War. So let's crack open the first issue and see if this continuation makes us want to turn the page or turn into a plasma cannon and vaporize it. Issue number one sees Bumblebee receiving damage from Cobra Commander Zartan and some other human in a trouble bubble titled Blocks Who It's Supposed to Be. And their normal-looking guns wouldn't cause those kinds of explosions, but hey, dramatic effect. Decepticons are closing in, who are so far okay with letting fleshlings doing their work for them. Even Starscream, which is weird because ruining Autobots is his life! Also, he's dead. The credits page gives us the creative team, Tim Seeley writing, with art by Joe Ung, Rob Ross, and... Meth? But with a three instead of an E? Anyway, as well as Kevin Yan, Rob Ruffalo, and Tom Liu. Apparently, after their time-traveling escapades, it was agreed that all Cybertronian tech on Earth would be decommissioned so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands again. So the Joes are chilling in a secret military base, waiting for their Autobot pals to collect the machinery stored there. Unbeknownst to the Joes, they are also guarding a most dangerous and highly secret experiment. If it's another DC Universe reboot from Dan Didio, I'm okay with nuking the site from orbit. We're first treated to a splash page of the scowling mug of the infamous Megatron, narration noting how much terror he's instilled throughout the galaxy. Megatron, a creature of pure hate and evil, known by many names. Scourge of Cybertron, the Slag Maker. And that one summer he needed to make some extra cash? Giggles, the dancing party clown. Though a cranium is all that's left the tyrant now, his muttering silenced by a scientist disabling his voice, and then sticking out his tongue at him. Something that gets him a lecture from a superior who reminds him that this machine is not a toy. Not yet. Marketing is still working on that. They just can't decide if they want him to be a handgun or some manner of tank. One guy even suggested combat chopper. The apparent guy in charge exposits how the Transformers have enabled them to create sentient weaponry, and goes on that it will be used to safeguard their country from those who would do it and its interests harm, as well as hunt down terrorists. So Martin should keep his juvenile displays to himself, lest he or anyone else lose respect for what they're doing. Meanwhile, his female associate eyes a humanoid figure in a stasis tube, labeled Serpent O.R., Pretty clever, unless this guy was shipped in from a strangely named town in Oregon. Twelve levels above, Joe's Hawk and Mainframe are preparing for some guests. Note the woman's Optimus Prime mug. Pretty sure that's from one of the animes. Anyway, Bumblebee, RC, Perceptor, and Grimlock arrive via portal. There are some pleasantries, but Grim makes it known he wants to get a move on. Enough talk! We do job and leave Mudball! This is closer to how Grimlock talked in the original cartoon, but in the last crossover, he was speaking rather eloquently, not much different from any other Autobot. So, is this an editorial oversight that no one informed Tim Seeley? Or is there going to be a later revelation that in between crossovers, uh, Grimsy suffered some manner of head trauma? First things first, Perceptor plays a message from Optimus Prime who thanks the Joes for their cooperation, as well as informing them that since Shockwave's defeat in Volume 2, Cybertron's become more peaceful, with fractured Decepticon forces being pushed back into gladiator zones. Are they not entertained? Well, I imagine not. I mean, they're kind of kicked out of society all for being evil and everything. In order to keep Earth free from any further remnants of their war, the Autobots aren't just there for scraps of defeated cons, but also mech suits they received at the end of the first crossover. How toyetic can you get? Roadblock isn't exactly going to miss them, and I don't blame the guy. They ever only saw use in part two, and I think even then it was only Snake Eyes. 
Scarlet wants one last game of tag in the machines, but the game is called on account of a mysterious tremor. The cause is an encroaching robot horde led by Cobra Commander, who gives a speech about the untold power waiting for them within the base. Zartan does call him out on this, saying that his mechanical thrall doesn't exactly need motivational speeches and references to a Yugoslavian hatchback, but he's not exactly a stranger to theatrics. And is it just me, or does that one look like Jim Gordon's bat mech? A different type of bat mechs, the battle android troopers, begin an aerial bombardment, only to be stopped by Scarlet, Snake, and Roadblock in their machines. Yo! Yo! Finally, I've been sitting on this other image I did for a couple of years now, and I get to show it off. Of course, a more appropriate time would be if they ever crossed over G.I. Joe with Power Rangers, but they haven't done that yet. Though if they did, I think this entitles me to 10... 20% of their merchandising sales. Just saying. As the Joes begin mowing down the considerably large forces, Double C lets Zartan indulge into a classic theatrical element from the G1 Transformers cartoon. Bats and snakes! Form Cobratron! I would have phrased it combined to form myself, but moving on. While the Joe mechs are bigger than individual robots, Cobratron is of course larger still, and could have stepped on any one of them had Grimlock not swiftly come in and chopped its foot off, with a slick anime pose to boot. The other Autobots join in with Hawk and a mech of his own, and we get a pretty amusing scene of Scarlet and RC quickly bonding over shooting the enemy and the scarcity of girlbots. Are they taking repaints into account, I wonder? Anyway, with things not going his way, the commander contacts Dr. Wise inside the base, who sets a beacon to a wall and kicks a guard, interrupting her. She's actually Zarana, Zartan's sister, and runs off, telling the soldier he should hightail it too. A disc-shaped device begins digging into the ground, pursued by Bumblebee after he evades a... donut-shaped robot? What exactly was the thought process that went into building that robotic soldier? Did Cobra Commander just hope that all enemy fire would just be drawn to the empty space in the torso? Or was he watching The Amazing World of Gumball while drunk and thought that the donut cop was an inspired design for a minion? B follows the tunnel to sub-level 12, interrupting Cobra's assault on the personnel inside, and sees Megatron's head, though it's framed just to the side of the panel with the central focus on a stasis tube from earlier, which I kind of find odd. You'd think the enemy leader would get more space, and if that's what Bumblebee's reacting to, that would be where the focus of the panel would be. In any event, Bumblebee is too distracted to notice Zartan apply an EM scrambler to his foot that electrocutes him into submission. Of all those robots, I hate that little yellow one the most. Why? It's not like he interfered with his plans any more than any of the other Autobots, or some of the Decepticons for that matter. I wondered if maybe it was supposed to be some kind of tongue-in-cheek reference to something from the old shows, but without any greater context, this just seems awkward. Attention is turned to Serpentor, which, yes, they do call him that even after saying Serpent O.R. His body tissue is bioorganic, which sounds kind of redundant when you think about it. Covered in bio-steel, its brain, much like the original animated villain, has the tactics and lessons from Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, and Genghis Khan. <laughs> Cobra's first step in utilizing this weapon against the United States? Freeing him by shooting the chamber he's in. Can you imagine that no one ever called him to contribute his militaristic acumen to this amalgamated super weapon? Slipping onto the floor like he just came back from an Atlantic City bender, Serpentor looks up, apparently recognizing the terrorist leader, and accessing a memory file, one of Drapeface taunting Megatron from when he was stuck in gun form. Apparently Serpentor's systems tried to terminate access to that memory, but he overrides it, instead opting to terminate the subject before him. He begins throttling the commander, but Zartan manages to use another scrambler on him. This works! momentarily as his systems reboot, and he outlines his objectives. Obtain knowledge, conquer, and crush any opposition. Using some sudden tendrils from his hands, and showing off what could be Minicon's sockets on his back, he tosses his would-be usurpers aside. 
the battle topside is just wrapping up, and after a wishbone joke goes over RC's cranium, Mainframe reports the breach on sublevel 12, and that's when Bumblebee's absence is finally noticed. Serpentor begins downloading Cybertron's history from Soundway's head, including the Quintessons creating the Transformers as slaves and gladiators, Megatron, Alpha Trion, and Optimus Primal? For those that might not know, Optimus Primal was the leader of a group of Autobot descendants known as Maximals in the show Beast Wars. They came from a future Cybertron, where the war had long since ended, and in pursuing the Decepticon descendants, known as Predacons, they landed on prehistoric Earth. And by the end of the series, they were headed back to Cybertron, more or less keeping their presence a mystery to the Autobots and Decepticons that were lying in stasis, so I don't know how Soundwave knows anything about Optimus Primal or anything related to him. And in the next four issues, this never gets brought up again, so I don't know why it's being brought up at all here. Though of particular interest is the Autobot Matrix of Leadership, which could potentially grant immense power. Finishing his history lesson, Serpentor takes a moment to show reverence to Megatron, whom he seems to regard as a father, apparently the basis of his programming, and then vows to obtain the Matrix, all decked out in snake-themed armor, which I guess was lying around. So, the government created a techno-organic warrior to fight terrorists like Cobra, and not only did they give it a snake theme to parallel those enemies, they also included the base programming from a highly advanced and malicious alien AI. That's so ludicrous, no wonder the second half of that premise was used in Age of Extinction. Issue 2's cover continues from the first though with R.C. and Scarlet charging in a different direction as more Decepticons converge. Put it next to the previous cover, it almost looks like they're leaving B high and dry. The summary of the first issue adds something we didn't see, that Serpentor also downloaded Earth's history. Maybe if he already had that knowledge, that makes sense, because he wouldn't have gotten it from Soundwave. Maybe it was planned, but cut for space or something, I don't know. Anyway, we go to Cybertron, where Optimus Prime is making a journal entry, specifically a recollection of Hawk saying how much he hated having to do paperwork on all the Cobra stuff that went down in Volume 1. Contextually, Prime guessed that it was an unpleasant use of his time. It seems the way of humans to bemoan spending time on undesirable things. They are not to blame, though. Humans have such short, fragile lives. They wish every moment to be as well spent as possible or spending time on things that are supposed to be desirable, only to end up making internet videos complaining about them on the off chance they end up sucking. Why are you looking at me like that? Optimus, on the other hand, before being chosen by the Matrix, did a lot of paperwork of a sort, and rather enjoyed it. In fact, he sometimes misses being archivist. Maybe that's why he's observing all these screens right now. It's kind of difficult to tell what's going on in any of them, though. Hot Rod enters, telling him the Earth team has been held up from their decommissioning job, but with Grimlock not sounding concerned over Earth villains and their pea shooters, they probably won't pose much of a problem. Prime, knowing Cobra Commander is involved, realizes there's probably more to it than seemingly inferior weaponry. I'm actually glad he didn't say more than meets the eye. It's not like we need that phrase as a tongue-in-cheek joke in every Transformers story. On Earth, Grimm is taking out a very large mech, which is odd since I thought they dispatched all of Cobra's forces last issue, until he's informed Bumblebee is underground and possibly injured. Then he gets mad. And this is the first time I've seen Grimlock show concern for someone else. And actually, it's the first time I've seen him show anything other than disdain for humans. Inside the lab, Cobra Commander is coming around noting that the Megatron essence within the android seemed to remember him. He rues the day he ever found the Transformers in the first place, and decides to work out some aggression by bashing B's face in with a pipe, but rethinks it when he finds himself surrounded by Autobots and Jomex. B's low on energy, but not so low he can't flirt with RC? That's new, but that's kind of a common theme in this crossover series. Upon finding Megatron's head, Perceptor tears into Hawk, but the commander says he didn't know this sublevel existed at all, let alone what was going on. The base was only meant as a temporary base for the Joes, after all. Scarlet asks Cobra Commander what his intentions were, but when he refuses, 
that's when you send in the giant angry robot dinosaur. He explains what the US government had been doing, using Cybertronian tech to develop the highly advanced Serpent Organic Robot. So now we know what the OR stands for, but still not why they went with a snake theme. It was intended to be a tireless, unquestioning replacement of sorts for the human soldier. And he's right behind you. That's quite obviously above you, stupid... Wait a minute. He knows it's above, but he's saying behind in order to trick them into looking the wrong direction, thus making them more vulnerable to attack. Ah, maybe he is an evil genius after all. The android uses its tendrils to take control of Roadblock's mech and Grimlock, though can't seem to get it right with the Dinobot. Locating his spark, what is essentially a Transformer's life essence, and not liking being denied, opts to commandeer Snake Eyes' mech instead, forcing the two Joe units to attack their allies. Cobra Commander tries to escape with the Z siblings and their unique digging device, even if they have to go through Hawk's mech to do it. Meanwhile, I guess Serpentor's got Wi-Fi because not only has his tendrils retracted, he's even controlling Scarlet's robot, too. Speaking of, she's suddenly behind the new foe, covered by some debris. Feels a tad convenient, don't it, folks? She tries a sneak attack, but Serpy's well acquainted with her Taekwondo and over 220 other forms of martial arts. He throws her against a wall, causing it to break, so it's probably plaster, otherwise she's crippled, and he declares himself the son of Megatron, future Matrix Bearer, and eventual ruler of Cybertron. It's nice he set himself these big goals at such a young age, but you know he's just gonna forget all about them when he goes backpacking through Europe. Despite the fact he just controlled his enemy's weapons and let them do the fighting for him for the most part, Serpentor considers his opponents noble warriors, an honor to meet in battle, and decides to bury them in rubble because he's got things to do. Several levels above, He's knocking aside some soldiers looking for a means to reach Cybertron, which he happens to know is somewhere on the base. The bulletproof Serpentor grabs Mainframe, asking if anyone can stand against him. Weird, considering he just dropped some of this base on honorable warriors that were already challenging him. Now he wants someone to stand in his way? Well, he gets shot in the face by the pigtailed young woman we saw with the Optimus mug in issue one. But Serpentor doesn't fight children, and tells her to leave or get axed. So not only does he have an age-limit subroutine on his combat programming, he's estimating someone working for the government isn't an adult. Then he immediately enters the room with the warp gate, muttering how he can hear the whisper of the Matrix call to him. Bring pizza and a two-liter of Mountain Dew. I think Domino's has a special going on. Joes and the Autobots dig themselves out of the rubble, but there's no sign of Scarlet, who wasn't in her suit when the ceiling fell. Snake Eyes seems to assume the worst, punching some rubble, and I guess RC, who's thus far seemed new to Earth, became close enough that she tries comforting him specifically. But hold off on funeral arrangements, because not only did she manage to avoid being crushed, she also found some scientists hiding in a large vent, I guess? Meanwhile, Serpentor programs the warp gate that brought the Autobots to Earth to send him to Cybertron's Gladiator Zone. He intends to return and add Terra Firma to his empire, but until then, starts wrecking the computers so no one can follow him, just before walking through the gate. Yes, now there's the height of intelligence. Screwing with the machine that opens up a portal between two planets that are light years away and walking through said portal mid-sabotage. In the aforementioned zone, where we see a reference to a completely different Transformers comic with all our dead graffiti, the Seacon Nautilator is running when he's attacked by one of the Predacons who control that specific area. He blasts his assailant and, with more Preds on the way, heads for the nearest green pool, calling for backup. That backup is seen in full force as the aquatic Decepticons have united into Piranacon. Not to be outdone, or crushed, the Predacons combine to form Predaking, and the great big robo-kaiju battle commences. Soon enough, Predaking knocks his opponent down, but before he can deal a final fatal strike, both Gestalts are ensnared by Serpentor's tendrils. Paralyzed, they are also uploaded with information by Megatron's progeny, including his plans to reignite the war. 
the story has a pretty strong start to it, and it feels very evocative of the cartoons it's based on, much like the previous two installments. As far as the old cartoon is concerned, it feels pretty in character for Cobra Commander to arrogantly stumble into unleashing a threat more powerful than himself. Serpentor's creation does deviate from the original, being a robotic body instead of a combination of genetic material, as in the original G.I. Joe animated movie, and they basically made him Megatron's offspring, which, for its own little universe, could have some interesting explorations. His warrior's code shtick was sort of all over the place, though. But that being said, much remains to be seen. Among them, if the U.S. government's intentions are ever revealed to be as sinister as Cobra Commander implied. Tune in next time to see if any of these curiosities see clarification, or if they are forgotten about by series end, just like why Primal made a cameo. I'm the Angry Spork, and man have I got issues. Toyetic is a word created by marketing people. It means an object or device featured in a cartoon that could easily become a mass-produced toy.